Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The word of our God for our meditation this evening is the gospel lesson and we've just heard from Luke 20. Jesus went on to tell the people this parable, a man planted a vineyard. The teachers of the law and the chief priests looked for a way to arrest him immediately because they knew he had spoken this parable against them, but they were afraid of the people. Their fellow redeemed. What were you thinking? Have you ever said that to anyone? What were you thinking? Or has someone ever said that to you? When we hear these words of this section of Scripture this evening, I think that question comes to mind, what were you thinking? Jesus is here speaking, and it says he's speaking to the people. But while there was a crowd of people that had gathered around to hear him, the context makes it plain that Jesus was directing this parable especially to the Jewish religious leaders and the time is Tuesday of Holy Week just two days before Jesus would be arrested and the Jewish religious leaders they had been increasing their harassing of Jesus gradually over the past three years and we'd have to ask what were you thinking And Jesus is teaching the people here in the temple court that day. And the religious leaders, they're not really thrilled about it. After all, he hadn't asked permission from them to do that teaching. So who in the world did he think he was? That he didn't check with them first? And what was worse, what he was saying they didn't really want to hear. And so they ask him, tell us, By what authority are you doing these things? Who gave you this authority? And we say, what were you thinking? And a brief conversation that follows then results with, Jesus doesn't really answer that question after all. If they didn't know the answer to that question, by whose authority are you doing this by this time, after seeing the miracles he had performed, And seeing the words he had spoken where he even called himself clearly the Son of God, Jesus knew they weren't really looking for information. No, he knew they had their minds made up. He knew that their minds were set dead against him. So instead of answering the question, Jesus tells them this parable. A man planted a vineyard. And Mark tells us that this man not only planted the vineyard, he put a wall around it, he dug a wine press in the middle, and he built a watchtower. In other words, this man had done everything necessary to make this vineyard successful. He had put a lot of work into that property, work that now the tenants could benefit from. The tenants... They were people who couldn't afford to buy a vineyard on their own. And so they were glad to strike a deal with this man, that they were able to work this finely prepared vineyard and reap some of the benefits for themselves. Yes, they had to give some of the harvest to the landowner. And that was entirely fair because finally it was his land and he had put a fair amount of work into preparing this vineyard. And now comes the time when the master comes to collect the harvest. And the tenants refuse to give him what was due him. They're not going to live up to this deal. Instead, they take this master's servant who had come to collect that share of the harvest on behalf of his master, and they beat him and sent him away empty-handed. In fact, the Greek actually indicates here that this beating was probably a bit more than just a punch in the gut and a shove out the door. The Greek words here actually say a tearing off of the skin, a wounding severely. And so the master sends a second servant. And the tenants do the same thing to him. 
and the master sends a third servant. And a similar thing happens to him. In fact, Matthew and Mark indicate to us that the master sent quite a number of servants. And some of them were actually not only beaten severely, some of them were even killed. Finally, the master decides he's going to send his beloved son to them, assuming they will respect him. They will not harm his son. But the tenants, for some reason, they think that if they kill the son, who is the heir of the vineyard, then this vineyard is going to belong to them. And I suppose that in some ways that's not too surprising. Because after all, isn't this what all of their actions had indicated? They weren't content with being tenants of that vineyard. They wanted to own that vineyard. They wanted every single thing there for themselves. So that's exactly what they do. They throw the son out of the vineyard, the vineyard that really belonged to him, and they kill him. At this point, Jesus states the obvious, that the master's patience will come to an end and that he will bring the worst kind of judgment on those tenants, killing them and giving the vineyard then to others. People who would be satisfied to be good tenants, who would be grateful with the share of benefits that would come to them. And the people gathering there listening to this parable, they say, may this never be. And Jesus responds in effect, oh, but it will be. And he quotes a passage from Psalm 118, warning them that the stone the builders rejected, just like that son that the tenants rejected, it's going to eventually cause their death. Was not only the story itself clear, but also the application very clear? You bet it was. The teachers of the law and the chief priests looked for a way to arrest him immediately because they knew he had spoken this parable against them. They knew enough of Jesus' parables from the past that the man, the master in the parable, that was God. And they knew from the Old Testament book of Isaiah that the vineyard which this man had shown such care, that's God's chosen people. That's the nation of Israel. Isaiah wrote, The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the house of Israel. And they knew that they, the religious leaders, they were the tenants. They had been given the privilege of working in God's vineyard, of tending the souls of God's chosen people. But that hadn't been enough for them. They didn't want to be tenants working for the master. They wanted to be the owners. They wanted to run the show. They wanted to rule the vineyard as their own personal property. And so when God sent the prophets to them to warn them about their sin, to warn them about God's coming judgment, to urge them to repent so that they would avoid judgment, when God sent prophets to them to collect the harvest, the fruits, as John the Baptist called it, fruits in keeping with repentance, the religious leaders treated these ambassadors of God every bit as rudely as the men in this parable treated the servants. How did the Jews treat the prophets? Tradition tells us that Jeremiah was stoned by the exiles in Egypt. Isaiah was sawed in two by King Manasseh. The Bible tells us how Jezebel threatened to kill Elijah and even chased after him with her army. King Joram threatened to kill the prophet Elisha. 
And while they actually succeeded in stoning to death a man named Zechariah, simply because he told them that their forsaking of God would lead to God's forsaking of them. The whole attitude, the whole response of the Jews to God's servants who were sent to them, one after another, is summed up in the letter to the Hebrews. Some faced jeers and flogging, while still others were chained and put in prison. They were stoned. They were sawed in two. They were put to death by the sword. And God himself says so sadly through the prophet Jeremiah, again and again I sent my prophets, but they did not listen or pay attention. They did not turn from their wickedness or stop burning incense to other gods. And now God sent them his own son. As the man in the parable refers to his son as the one whom I love, God referred to Jesus in that same way at his baptism and at the transfiguration just a few days before he told them this parable. And Jesus tells the people here how they will treat him and just a few days after he's talking to them right here, they will kill him. But he also issues this warning to them. Rejecting God's prophets is a bad idea. Rejecting God's son is a worse idea because God himself will bring a judgment upon them. And yet despite this warning, the response of the Jewish leaders here is to look for a way to arrest Jesus immediately so that they might kill him. Can you believe it? What were they thinking? It's almost incomprehensible that the leaders would react in this way. Here God had given that nation everything, bringing them out of the slavery of Egypt, becoming a wall of protection around them, placing for them specifically in charge of the beloved vineyard, his beloved people. But that wasn't good enough for them. Enjoying God's blessings, living thankful lives for those blessings, that wasn't enough for them. They wanted to be in charge. They wanted to run the show. They resented anyone who would remind them that everything wasn't about them, but rather about their good and gracious God. And they re even resented it when God gave them the clearest proof of his goodness in the form of his one and only son. Can you believe it? What were they thinking? With the crowd, we also have to confess that the justice of their punishment, we have to say too in the strongest possible terms, may this never be. Oh, but it is. God has treated us, you and me, as his special people. Not only given us fantastic material blessings on this earth. But he's given us his word in a completeness and detail that the Old Testament believers would have envied. God has promised to protect us from our enemies, to save us from the greatest sin, death, and hell itself. And he has entrusted, put in our hands, his holy word. And yet when God sends us his word, when he sends us his word through pastors and teachers and parents and concerned brothers and sisters in Christ, when he calls us to live lives that don't just give a lip service to the concept of repentance, but lives that actually bring forth the fruit of repentance, and we resent them, when we'd rather listen to our own selfishness of our heart that says, take care of yourself first, instead of acknowledging the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. And yes, he does have the right 
to tell us how we are to use our time and how we are to use our possessions as we serve him. Aren't we then really refusing the owner of the vineyard, the fruit of his harvest, just like those wicked tenants in this parable? And we have to ask of ourselves, what were you thinking? Sadly, all of us too often choose our sinful ways instead of God's ways. And we have to ask, what were you thinking? But at least we didn't nail Jesus to that cross like those religious leaders did a few days later. But then why does Scripture tell us he was pierced for our transgressions? He was crushed for our iniquities? It was our guilt and our burden of our sin that also brought about the death of God's beloved Son. The fact is that in God's eyes, our every sin is claiming that we know better than what he knows, that we are the masters of the vineyard and not the Lord. And now we have to ask, what are you thinking? And at times we are even tempted to respond violently when God sends us his very own son when he sends us his son with warnings concerning lust and we violently tear those words up, and when he sends us his son with words of condemnation concerning hatred and we violently cross them out and saying, well, some people just deserve to be hated. And when he says that the standard that we ought to hold ourselves to is holiness, be holy because God is holy. Don't we at times like grab a scissor and cut those words out? And rather than saying holy, we replace it. Well, it's enough to be pretty good. It's enough to at least try to be better than others. And when he says that we ought to repent of our sin or we'll perish in hell, there's our part of us that thinks that someone as good as we, that really can't be talking about us. Remember in this parable that the tenants said when the son came to them, this is the heir, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. Sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? Like the sort of thing that no one in their right mind would say. It's true, no one in their right mind would say it. And yet, don't we say that same thing all the time when we choose to ignore Jesus and his words? We're basically saying, if I ignore Jesus and his commands, then I'm going to be happier than I can be as a tenant in God's vineyard. Then I'm not only merely going to be a happy tenant, then I'm going to be the master of my life. If Israel, who had Jesus warn them personally as he did in this text tonight, if they fell, then we can fall too. Even if we've been confirmed, even if we've gone to Christian school, even if we've been church members for decades, we still have that stubborn old sinful nature that can lead us away. Each and every one of us, we need to hear Jesus' warning to not reject him. Not reject him as the foundation of our faith, or we too will be crushed by God's judgment in hell, which is what every one of our sins truly deserves. But is that it? Is that all there is in this parable this evening? A warning to not act in the future like we have already acted in the past? Isn't there any hope in this parable? Yes, this parable does display the stubborn unbelief of people. 
it also displays the relentless love of God. What man in his real life would keep on sending servant after servant after servant? And who would even send his own son into such a danger? Don't we have to answer nobody? But isn't that the point of this parable? In his relentless love, in his desire to reconcile and save the whole world, God would do this very same thing. He would send his one and only son to die. Yes, the son would be treated no better than any of God's prophets. They would despise him and kill him. The builders would reject the most important building block of all, and yet God's will would be done, and God's kingdom would be built. As we're standing in the final days of another Lenten season, and actually every single day, we need to remember what God was thinking. Never pass up his great love and patience by being cold and uncaring as though that were no big deal. Instead, let us sorrow over our sins and lay them down at Jesus' cross and then lift up our eyes and see him with his outstretched arms there on the cross welcoming us in that forgiving love that does not fail. May we pray that the Holy Spirit would make this amazing love of God burn brightly in our hearts and produce that fruit of faith. And may his love lead us every day to gladly serve him with every word and every action guided by his word. And if you live that way, and someone asks you, what are you thinking? You can answer, I'm thinking about my Savior. I'm thinking about his great love for me, love that saved me, love that changes me. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in faith through Christ Jesus. Amen.